Okay, okay, here we, here we are. We... Last week. Let me lecture a little bit or talk a little bit. So, um, this week is important. It's a good transition between first semester mechanics and second semester electricity and magnetism. Uh, mechanics tends to be more concrete. We think of forces in a very traditional and regular way, and the only quote-unquote non-contact force that we deal with is the force of gravity. And in our life experience, we don't really see the force of gravity as being mysterious, because when you drop something, it falls. But think about it. How does it fall? How does something fall to the earth? without being pushed or pulled. Well, it is pulled. How is it pulled? This kind of action at a distance, this non-contact force, has puzzled people through the ages. And next semester, we'll deal with the electric force and the gravitational force, which are also non-contact forces. And the way in which the gravitational force works is very similar to the way in which the electrostatic force works. And much of what you'll learn this week will launch directly into the first week of next semester. So that's the first item. Uh, second, uh, you're, we don't have lectures, so you're kind of on your own except for this video. You do have a textbook. There is a chapter in the textbook on gravity and gravitation and Newton's universal law of gravitation. And so you have that resource and there are other online resources. Your focus, however, should be doing the assignment. So go to the assignment. If you can't do the problems, then come to this video or go other places to figure out how to do the problems. And I'll try and give you some hints on the assignment after we go through, oh, probably 10 minutes or so of introductory comments. And so the videos are good because you can scroll through them, you can go to different parts of them, you don't have to watch the whole thing. So let's start with uh, gravity. And the story's kind of fun. In fact, even more relevant now, since we're in this COVID-19 thing, the story as I heard it was that the Black Plague hit Europe and Newton was sent from London back to the country, and by that time he had been puzzling over the fact that planets move in circles around the sun, and moons move in circles or circular, slightly elliptical orbits around planets, and by this time they knew things move in straight lines. We know Newton's laws. No force, something moves in a straight line. So how is it that um, a planet moves around, a moon moves around a planet? What's the force pulling on it? There has to be a force. Prior to this, people thought, oh, heavenly bodies, they naturally move in circles. And by Newton's time, they know, no, things don't naturally move in circles. So anyway, as the story goes, the apple falls on his head. <laughs> and he thinks like, well, what's pulling on the apple? Why do things fall to the earth? There must be some force of attraction toward the earth. And as un un amazing as it seems to us, at that time, no one had really thought that, oh, maybe the force that the Earth exerts on the apple is the same force that the Earth exerts on the moon. <laughs> what an, a great idea. Anyway, it proved to be correct. And Newton formulated in a mathematical way that remains true today, his universal law of gravitation. And here it is. Um, the force, you can read this if you want to pause the video and read this. You can find it in the textbook. 
but any two masses, any two masses will exert a force of attraction on each other based upon the fact that they have mass, and that force will be proportional to the distance squared between them. And then there's, of course, a gravitational constant. And this, do we have this anywhere? It's not in this one. It's on your equation sheet. It's something like 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, it's down here, actually. Right down here. 6.67, 6.7 times 10 to the minus 11. So it's a very small number. The force of gravity is weak. And so that's why when you put two balls on the table, two tennis balls on the table, they don't collide with each other. They don't attract each other. And why does the apple fall? Because the earth is big. So if one of the masses is big, the force will be big. If the two masses are both small, the force will be small. And we'll talk about how this is measured later. So that's the force of gravity. It depends on three things the mass of the first object, the mass of the second object, and the distance between their centers, okay? And, well, of course, this gravitational constant. And so if we wanted to calculate the force of the Earth on the moon, we would just use this equation. The g, the gravitational constant, the mass of the Earth, the mass of the moon, and the distance between the moon center and the earth center squared and that would give us the force and that's the force that keeps the moon moving in a circle. Okay, let's use that to do a problem. Very simple problem. Here's a person standing on the earth and we're going to use everything we learned all semester. Energy forces everything. So here's the person Here's the free body diagram. There's the force of attraction of the Earth on the person. They don't even have to be standing on the Earth. They could be suspended. And then there's the normal force supporting the person. If we hung a person by a rope, this would be a tension force. But let's calculate, using Newton's universal law of gravitation, what the force would be on, let's say, a hundred... New, a hundred kilogram person. That's a big person, 220 pounds. But anyway, 100 kilogram person. Um, here's the radius of the Earth. And kind of round it off a little bit. Oh, and we need the mass of the Earth. The mass of the Earth is 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. These are all things that you can easily find, and they'll be given to you in most of the problems you're doing. Okay, so use Newton's law and find out what the force on the 100 kilogram person is standing on the earth. We know how to do that in an easier way, but just do it the long way and see what happens. Okay, look at what I did. I wrote down the force equals g, mass of the person, mass of the earth, divided by the radius of the earth. Why the radius of the earth? Because from the center of the earth to the center of the person is the radius of the earth, squared. And then I took the mass of the person out front, and I just collected the g, mass of the Earth, radius of the Earth squared, and I put all that together. So if you calculate this, notice we can, when I square this, I'm going to have 10 to the 12th here, 10 to the 24th here. That will leave 10 to the 12th, Then this is 10 to the minus 11. So I'm going to end up with, if you just put the numbers in, it'll be this number times 10 to the 1. So do that calculation. Okay, if you did that, you got 9.814 something. And if you check out the units, the uh, meters squared will cancel, and this 1 kilogram gets rid of that, and the units end up being newtons per kilogram. And so you see there's our what? That's our G. Oh, why isn't it 9.80? Well, because we did some rounding here in these numbers. And if we did this right, it would come out to be something like 9.805. Okay, so that's our G, and if we multiply that by 100, so this is where G comes from, our G. 
And this G, notice in the past, when we used this 9.8, we had meters per second squared, but I wrote it as newtons per kilogram, because this G is not constant. The G that we know at the surface of the Earth, it's this. But if you go away from the surface of the Earth, G gets weaker. And this is what we're later going to call the gravitational field strength. It tells us in units of newtons per kilogram what the force on anything will be when it's placed in the gravitational field. And the concept of gravitational field, we're going to learn about it this week. And next semester when we start to talk about electric charge, right away we'll jump into the concept of electric field. So this is a very new but rather abstract concept the concept of field and very important in physics and and engineering and sciences okay so if we multiplied the hundred kilograms times that the kilograms would cancel and would end up with a force of 981.4 newtons okay let's do another problem now let's go back to the earth and the moon let's just think about what's going on here there's a gravitational force between them. So what that means is the fact that this equation works for either object, and by Newton's third law, if the Earth pulls on the moon, the moon must be pulling on the Earth. So why does the moon move around the Earth and not the Earth move around the moon? It's just a matter of mass, right? If a trailer truck hits a cone in the road, the force of the trailer truck on the cone and the force of the cone on the trailer truck are equal and opposite, but the motion isn't equal. So the moon's much smaller. The earth, in fact, does wobble because of the moon's action on it, but it's so much more massive, we don't see that motion. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you something that we'll use in lab as well, is that if we look at the moon, uh, we can use it to get the mass of the Earth by looking at the motion of the moon. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to use Newton's gravitational law and Newton's second law that says that force equals mass times acceleration. So we're going to draw a free body diagram of the moon there it is, actually, the vector there. This is a velocity vector. And then we're going to apply Newton's second law to the moon, and you're going to see that we can use that to calculate the mass of the Earth. Of course, we do need to know the moon-Earth distance. I don't have it here. Let me get it for you and come back. Okay, there's the distance. Give it a shot. This is what you're doing. You're, you're saying that force equals mass times acceleration. So the force is the gravitational force that's equal to the mass of the moon times its acceleration. So you got to remember about what we learned about acceleration of objects moving in a circle. And here's the, uh, the distance between the Earth and the moon, and it's in kilometers. So remember, like I didn't point that out last time, but you have to change the kilometers to meters. So go ahead, give it a shot, see if you can do that. Okay, so some or here's the free body diagram, there's the moon, there's the force on it. Could put it anywhere, but I just put it that way. And so there's just one force on the moon, and that's going to accelerate in a circle. So it's equal to the mass of the moon times its acceleration. So here's the force, g, mass of the earth, mass of the moon, distance between the earth and the moon squared equals the mass of the earth times its acceleration. Well, it's moving in a circle. You may not remember this, but you do need to know it for the exam, and it'll come up a lot next semester. When an object moves in a circle, its centripetal acceleration is v squared over r. What's the r? The radius of the circle. What's the radius of the circle? The radius of the circle is the same as the distance between the centers, so that's the radius. That's the Earth-Moon distance. 
And what's the v? What's the velocity of the Earth? Well, the velocity is the distance over the time. And what's the distance? 2 pi r, the circumference of the circle it moves in. What r? The r that it's moving in. Oh, you weren't able to think of all that? Okay. Times what? Times the time it takes to do one cycle. That's called the period of rotation, right? The time for one cycle. Okay, so see if you can put all that together. Everything in there is known. What's the time of one cycle? Well, it's a month. Okay, so we could look that up. Uh, it's something like, let's just use 28 days. Okay, that'll be close enough. In the meantime, I might look it up. But use 28 days. Of course, you've got to put it in seconds, and you're going to have to do the algebra. So dig in. See if you can simplify this down to a simple equation by substituting in and doing the algebra. Go ahead. Okay, check out the algebra. So what I did was notice that the mass of the moon is on both sides of the equation. Oh, that's good. So we don't need to know the mass of the moon. Interesting. And I can cancel out one of these REMs. This, this is squared, so I canceled those out. And that just leaves me with V squared over here. So I have the GME over RME. It's no longer squared. Times the velocity squared. So 2 squared is 4. Pi squared is pi squared. REM squared is REM squared, and the T, the period squared, is squared. And what are we after? We're after the mass of the Earth. So I do the algebra. I have 4 pi squared REM cubed, right, because this comes over here, divided by GT squared. So there it is. There's the mass of the Earth. You can do the calculation. The T is 27.3 days. So go ahead, try doing the calculation. And if you are too lazy, that's fine. But you're going to have to do some of these when you get to the assignment. I'm going to do it and come back and let you know what it is. Okay, it worked out just fine. 6.02. We don't even trust it to three digits, I don't think, here. 6.02 times 10 to the 24th. Remember in the earlier problem we said the mass of the Earth is about 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. So don't get lost in the math. Appreciate what we just did. By observing the motion of the moon, knowing the distance to the moon, we were able to just calculate the mass of the Earth. How's that for amazing? You can imagine why people in Newton's time were so excited and people were using that to measure the masses of astronomical bodies using Newton's universal law of gravitation together with Newton's second law of motion. Okay, I'm back. So I just looked at the assignment and I noticed there's a, fill, a lot of fill-in-the-blank problems that some of those you might have trouble with in the beginning. Do what you can and just hold them. We've covered a lot about forces and Newton's universal law of gravitation, and that will help you do a lot of the problems. We discussed about centripetal acceleration and moving in a circle, and you can use that to work on the space station problem. Maybe I'll take a little bit of a look at one of those to help you. Um, but I noticed, I think problem six is about escape velocity, and that's a conservation of energy problem. So we haven't talked about energy. So let's, before we go talk about energy, since I uploaded these figures, let's just go through, let's first go through the figures. So first we have this one. This is, oh, that's the energy one. Let's hold that. Here's the one for gravitational fields. And remember what we did. We said that G is equal to this quantity. And so if R is the radius of the Earth, you get a G equal to 10. So this idea of gravitational field will be important. It shows up also in this figure. All right, this is what I did. I isolated the G, the mass of the Earth, and the R. 
Now you could do this for any planet or object. You could go g times the mass of Mars times the radius of Mars squared and it would tell you what the gravitational field strength of Mars is. Or you could do it for the moon. Put in the mass of the moon in g and the radius of the moon and you'd get a value which is about one-sixth of 9.8 or about one-sixth, right? People say, oh, if you're on the moon, you're going to weigh one-sixth of what you did. All that comes out of this equation here. So that's about gravitational force and gravitational fields. We'll have more of that. Now we want to talk about energy. So we know from our study of mechanics that gravitational potential energy, we described it as being mgh. Right? And that works fine on the surface of the Earth. But if you wanted to get the gravitational potential energy, say, how much potential energy does a satellite have if it fell, falls to Earth? Can you just use MGH? The answer is no, because the force of gravity varies between the surface of the Earth as you go away. And so the way that works is... You have to do the integral of the work done. So if you think about this, let's just take a look at this concept. If we take this figure out, suppose this is a satellite, not a moon. And if we want to put a satellite into orbit, how much energy does it take? How much energy is this satellite going to have when it's here as opposed to the surface of the Earth? And the way that we would, the way you should think about that, this will be important next semester too, is how much work would it take to lift a satellite from the surface of the Earth to this position? And so that goes back to our concept of work and we get potential energy by doing the work energy calculation. But since the force varies with distance, right, we have to calculate the work done as the force is varying, so we actually have to do an integration. And right now I'm not going to try and go through that, but remember we used U, we used PE a lot, but U is also the symbol for potential energy, and so the gravitational potential energy would be this integral, and the result of this integral is this equation. So this is the equation you want to use. It's on your equation sheet. The, gravi the change in gravitational potential energy and moving an object from one place to another would be calculated this way. And notice how close this is to the universal the universal, the Newton's universal law of gravitation. The only difference is the r isn't squared. So what happens? When we do the integral, the r squared forced ends up being this. Okay, so if you want to calculate the difference in potential energy between an object on the surface of the Earth and an object at some other distance, you would calculate this and do the delta. You know, you calculate the initial potential energy and the final. So we're going to use this to do problem number six in the lab, uh, in the assignment. So you might go and look at problem number six. Okay, so this concept of escape velocity is pretty important in astronomy. And yet, the physics is not that complicated. Let's not make it more complicated than it is. Let's think back to when we threw a, we threw a ball up in the air, and uh, it went up in the air and fell back. And how high it went depended only on its velocity. It didn't depend on its mass. So you might remember that if we threw a ball at 30 meters per second going up, uh, it would go up 45 meters. We did that problem way back. And if you throw it a little faster, it'll go a little higher, right? But it'll fall back. And 
how high it goes depends only on the velocity that you throw it at. So if you throw it faster, it's going to go further. And at some point, you're going to throw it fast enough where it's going to go away and not come back. And the way to think about that is conservation of energy, right? And so you have to give it enough kinetic energy so that you can change its gravitational potential energy by that amount. It's that simple, right? And so the kinetic energy is what? It's going to be one half. And so it goes away, it's going to go up. It just needs, it can stop once it's up there, but it has to be far enough away that it doesn't come back. And so it's going to be one half m v final squared minus one half m v initial squared, where the v final squared can be zero and we're looking for the V initial squared. How fast do we have to throw it such that we give it enough energy? And so for this, we need to use this equation. We need to calculate the difference in potential energy uh, between the surface of the Earth and infinity as R goes to infinity. And that's... Um, so try that. Okay, there are a couple things here that are a little bit tricky to comprehend the first time around. One is that notice that the gravitational potential energy equation has a negative sign. And that's because if you take an object and take it very far away, we consider it to have zero energy. So if we take g, the mass of the Earth times the mass of the object, oh, I made a mistake, I squared those. Wait a second. Easy to do. Okay, so if you divide a number by infinity, you get zero. So as an object falls to the Earth, it's starting zero and it's gaining energy. That means its gravitational potential energy in a mathematical sense must be considered negative. So anyway, ignoring that positive or negative conundrum, the gravitational potential energy of the object at the surface will be this. And the gravitational potential energy far away will be zero. And so it should be final minus initial. So this ends up being um, two negatives. So anyway, watch what happens. So this is zero. And the mass, what's this M? It's the thing that we're throwing. It's the ball or the satellite or any object that we want. It doesn't matter what the mass is. The velocity it takes to escape the Earth is a, is a given number. So we can cancel out the mass of the object that we're doing. It doesn't matter whether it's small or big. And so we end up with the escape velocity equals, multiplying by 2, g times the mass of the Earth divided by the radius of the Earth. And then we need to take the square root. So I hope you're curious. Let's calculate what that is. OK, there it is. Uh, put all the numbers in, take the square root, and you get 11.2 times 10 to the third meters per second. That would be 11.2 kilometers per second. Think about a kilometer. Think about 11.2 kilometers. What is that? About 8 miles per second. So pretty darn fast. But if something's moving at that speed, it escapes the Earth's gravitational pull. And so those are the kind of speeds we need to get something into orbit. Okay, so there's a lot more to talk about in the assignment, but you've got enough to get started, and this video is almost a half an hour long, so I'm going to post this and then try and look for a follow-up video on the rest of the assignment problems sometime later. Okay.